July 4th, 1776, the city of Philadelphia, in the province of Pennsylvania. John Dunlap, an Irish-born printer, was working late into the night, making copies of a handwritten document that was delivered to him on the same day. How many copies he made that night are not known. It is estimated to be as high as 200 copies, and they would be among the most important documents he would print in his entire career. They were the Dunlap Broadsides. First, I should probably define what a broadside is. Before radio, televisions, or the, uh, Internets. Broadsides were a common way of disseminating all kinds of information to the public using large posters. Most of you probably know the date, July 4th, 1776, as the day that the Second Continental Congress, with representatives from the colonies, formally adopted a document declaring independence from Britain. There had already been skirmishes, between colonial and British forces at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts the previous year, and tensions were high. As you probably already know, you can't just declare independence from another nation if the other nation doesn't agree. The British were not about to let their colonies go. It wasn't until the British defeat at Yorktown in 1781 at the hands of a combined colonial and French force that the British were ready to acknowledge American independence. But back to the topic of the broadsides. John Dunlap was born in Strawbane, Ireland in 1747 and, at the age of 10, moved to the city of Philadelphia to apprentice for his uncle, William Dunlap, who was a printer. He would later own the business his uncle ran and eventually became the official printer for Congress. During the Revolutionary War, he served as a cavalry officer and saw action with George Washington at Trenton and Princeton. There was no question about his dedication to the revolution. In 1780, he even provided 4,000 pounds, a huge sum of money at the time, to help supply the revolutionary army. The generally believed timeline of events is that Jefferson, who, as a member of the Committee of Five, along with John Adams, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, and Benjamin Franklin, was tasked with authoring a declaration to be submitted to the Second Continental Congress. Jefferson wrote the first draft of the Declaration. Changes were made by members of the committee and Congress to reach the final version of the Declaration. Jefferson then prepared a fair copy of the Declaration, which was then used by Dunlap to print his famous broadsides. Or was it? Some have suggested Dunlap may have used a copy of Jefferson's fair copy, written by an aide and delivered to Dunlap before July 4th. There's a fragment of a Dunlap broadside in possession with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. This is not the final version of the broadside, as you can see some differences between this fragment and the final print. All these quotation marks and this A are not present in the final print. Why the fragment was printed in this way is not definitively known, but we do know that Congress did order new prints which is how we ended up with the broadsides we have today. By the way, you may have noticed the funny looking lowercase s's on the Dunlap broadsides. These are referred to as long s's, as opposed to the short s's we are all familiar with. And there are actually rules on how they are used. For example, you may have noticed that no long s's are used at the end of words. Futurama actually made a joke about these long s's in episode 23. Season 6, All the President's Heads. It should be noted that these aren't actually lowercase f's. The long s is actually derived from the German ez, also known as a sharp s. As you can see, the long s 
appears to have been taken from the left half of the Az. Not a surprise, given that English is a Germanic language, with some Romance influence, of course. You can thank the Normans for that. <laughs> Again, back to the broadsides. Interestingly, because the broadsides were printed in order to be distributed to the various state houses and assemblies of the 13 colonies, it is almost certainly the case that the colonists of the time heard or read the words of the Declaration from the Dunlap broadside rather than the later written engrossed Declaration of Independence. It is commonly believed that the first public reading of the Declaration was conducted by John Nixon on July 8, 1776, on the steps of the Pennsylvania State House using a Dunlap broadside. By the way, what is the engrossed Declaration of Independence? First of all, engrossed in this context means transcribed in large letters onto another piece of paper, or in this case, vellum. The engrossed copy, which we typically think about when discussing the Declaration of Independence, was ordered by Congress on July 19, 1776, and was written by Timothy Matlack. The founders added their signatures on August 2nd of the same year. I'm not saying Jefferson had bad handwriting, but I think you'd agree with me when I say that Matlack's penmanship adds some gravity to this document. So why is the ink so faded? Well, certainly part of it has to do with the passage of time. But in addition, it was displayed for about 35 years in the old patent office building with two windows that led in sunlight, although the document itself is shaded. The old patent office building now houses the National Portrait Gallery and the American Art Museum. I've been there before. It's a great place to visit. Actually, all the Smithsonian museums in Washington, D.C. are must-see in my opinion. Admission is free, so spend the whole day touring the excellent exhibits. The engrossed Declaration of Independence is now displayed in the National Archives Museum, which also houses the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Greater effort is now taken to help preserve the documents, including low light level and a cool environment. You might have noticed in the title sequence of this video that the Dunlap copy I showed is also stored in a low light environment for the same reason. This particular copy here is displayed in the Dallas Public Library and is freely available for public viewing. There are at least 26 copies of the Dunlap broadsides known to exist, with most in the hands of public institutions. One copy was actually found inside a picture frame that was purchased by an unnamed financial analyst in a flea market in Adamstown, Pennsylvania for $4. It was sold in 1991 for $2.4 million and later in the year 2000 for $8 million. It is one of the two surviving Dunlap copies in private hands. Dunlap broadsides continue to be found, with the most recent one found in 2008 inside a box in the National Archives in the UK. With this newest discovery, the UK National Archives is known to have three Dunlap broadsides. If you live in the United States, particularly in the New England area, it's likely that there's a Dunlap broadside available for public viewing near you. It may not be the first thing you think about when you hear Declaration of Independence, but the broadsides are still important historical documents, contemporaneous with the engrossed version. In fact, the Dunlap broadsides were printed before the engrossed version was written, and as I stated earlier, it's likely that most colonists would have gotten to see the text of the Declaration from one of the more numerous broadsides, so its historical importance shouldn't be dismissed. Thanks for watching, guys. I really do appreciate it. I know I should publish videos more often, but I do all the writing and editing myself. I don't have a team or anything, so it takes a while to produce a new video. Anyways, thanks for sticking around to the end, and have a nice day.